So I'm going to talk a little bit around um, something called cultural hacks, which um, yeah, just hands up as far as initially. Anyone heard of culture hacks before? No, it's cool. Okay, that's all right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk through a little bit around um, culture hacks. And um, really, I think as COVID 19's hit, I think it's been a bit of a mix with different businesses. Some have had um, business models that have suited what's happening in the world. So if you're providing uh, protective equipment, um, toilet paper, um, you've probably been okay. Um, if you're trying to fly aeroplanes and take people abroad, then probably not so much. And a lot of other companies have been somewhere in between. Some have had to pivot their business models a bit. I think companies like Burberry have been using their supply chain and their um, distribution centers and manufacturing lines to, to, um, to do PPE and things like that. So um, I think what it's shown for some companies is that particularly, so I, um, I work for Volkswagen Financial Services, and it's shown us that um, we can actually do things a little bit quicker than we thought we could. Um, some of that's sustainable, some of it's not, but I just want to talk a little bit around tonight around culture hacks. So some of these things that you can do in your culture to drive, to drive uh, beha different behaviors in your teams. Um, so this is me. Um, so as I said, I work, I'm an agile coach at um, Volkswagen Financial Services. Uh, I was based in Milton Keynes. I'm based in my spare bedroom. Uh, hopefully we're back in Milton Keynes at, at some point. Um, so we are, um, we're in the process really of turning what is, what is a pretty decent culture uh, into a great one. Um, we are looking at, uh, we're talking a lot around habits and, and behaviours. And um, as I say, COVID-19 has been a bit of a lesson for us on, you know, we thought things would take several months to do, decisions would take several weeks to make. And actually, we've been able to do things far quicker than we ever thought we could. We've made decisions to invest in things within a few hours. We've got all the people we needed in a room. We've delivered features in weeks that would normally take you know, months, if not years, to get through. Um, and so we're in a really interesting situation now where people are saying, why can't we do this all the time? And as I say, some of that is sustainable and, and some of it's not, but it's given us a really good ground to, to really look at our culture, look at some of our processes, some of our technology. Um, I'm not sure about other agile coaches, but I was, I was furloughed for a little while. Um, I was a little bit concerned, but it was a good excuse to go back to command and control. It's a crisis situation. I'm telling you what needs to be done. I'm telling you when it needs to be done by. Um, and there, there was a time and a place for that, but I think we quickly realized that actually empowered self-organizing cross-functional teams is the way that's going to give us a, a sustainable, happy business uh, with, with engaged and happy customers. So there's a few thoughts that come out from, from Gartner as well. So we've been talking to Gartner and a few other companies about um, culture hacks uh, last year and this year. Um, and it's just been really timely for us to pick up this topic again. So I think Gartner have noted that some digital transformations are beginning to stall. Um, employees are a little bit um, fatigued now with all of this talk around um, disruption and digital um, and the constant need for change and fast pace. Um, a lot of the big complex interventions that big companies often do with some of the big uh, consultancies isn't really having the lasting legacy that we would hope to see. Because again, a lot of these things, whilst they're around culture and transformation, they get treated like a project. So we want to change our culture. It's going to take six months. It's going to cost a million pounds. We're going to do these exact things in this exact order. And it's a lot more experimental than that because we're talking about people and we're talking about behavior. Um, and so they've introduced this kind of concept of, of culture hacking, as I say, a few years ago. Uh, it's, I feel like it's potentially being becoming a little bit more popular. Um, and so at bottom left there, they're really looking at um, when you talk about culture change, um, it's trying to do some of these low effort things and being clear why we're doing them. So I'll come on to some of them, but you know, we're looking at uh, not sending as many emails, but, but why is that important? Um, we want people to communicate and collaborate in a, in a different way, uh, more face-to-face, -face, or if not video calls than, than email, because often it's, it's difficult to read tone and sentiment via an email. And we, like a lot of businesses, we send an awful lot of emails. We get caught up in a lot of email chains that go on for 20, 30 um, responses. Um, and so this is about designing hacks with a kind of goal in mind. What is it in our team, in our department, in our company that we're looking to influence? What behavior are we looking to change? What, what habits are we looking to form? Uh, I, will, I will share these slides, these short slides afterwards. So I talk about culture, uh, I talk about habits. Um, you know, culture is this um, kind of characteristics of a group of people, some of these, some of these social habits that they have. Um, and it's really how you, you grow together and how you cult, cultivate and, and nurture uh, some of these habits. And, and habits themselves are, it's how we behave on a, on a regular basis and in a repeated way. It's kind of 
it's this kind of subconscious way that we do things and the way that we interact with each other. So some of these things are really intangible, but we now want to change some of these things to get really tangible benefits for our, our customer and our business. So Volkswagen Financial Services, um, I've, I've been really impressed the time I've been there on how much they do try and look after uh, colleagues, uh, how they're trying to become more and more focused on, on, on the customer. Um, they've put an awful lot of time and effort into uh, the creation and execution and socializing of our values and principles. We had a, a new set of guiding principles that came out last October and it's really trying to encourage teams to be more accountable, to be able to make decisions, to be autonomous. But the thing is, if you go to any company now around the UK and around the world, you'll probably hear all of these words. Um, and it's really easy to say, yeah, of course I want my teams to be able to make decisions because they can make them in the moment and we can get stuff delivered more quickly. We can realize value sooner. Um, of course I want people to be accountable. Um, but really it's, it is those small day in, day out habits and behaviors that we have as a leader or someone in a team that is really going to define what your culture is. Um, you know, at the moment we're saying we want people to be accountable and make decisions. A lot of our teams don't feel that they can make a decision. A lot of the policies, procedures that we have in place stop them from making a decision because it's over a certain budget size or the, or the risk is too great. So we've really got to dig into some of these specifics. But as I say at the beginning, this is not a transformation project. This is looking at the way people work together and experimenting with it. And an experiment that works really well in one team with one group of people is probably not going to work with another group of people. So this kind of it's experimental and we're all testing and learning. Um, we can talk about testing and learning with the products that we build and deliver but we're also testing and learning with the behaviors and habits in our teams. So when we talk about strategic alignment and prioritization and experiments with our products and services and our software, it's exactly the same with people, habits and behaviors. Um, we are talking more and more about inclusion, diversity and safety. Um, when I worked at RS Components, that's probably the first time that I heard um, psychological safety talked about. Again, that's gaining momentum in the industry. We're talking a lot more about trust and safety. Um, but what I've also found more recently is that's okay to talk about it, but what, when the, what about when there's not trust and when there's not safety? Um, how, how do we deal with that? Um, rather than just collecting data, it's more about how we're actually looking at behavior, um, looking at how we work together and some of these habits that we do have not consciously or unconsciously in our, in our teams. We are, as I say, talking about integrity. We're talking about the pace at which we do things, how flexible we are. So having the right skills available to us at the right times. Um, we want to work from anywhere policy. We want autonomy and efficiency and trust, as I say. So we're saying all of the right things, um, but I think everybody craves the tangible. What is it we're going to do right now? Because as I say, we, a lot of companies are very good at the marketing side of culture change, but actually what are some of the specific things that I can do in my team tomorrow that may positively or negatively influence our culture by looking at behavior and habit? Uh, we're trying to, as I say, with not just with the product changes that we make, but also the cultural changes we're looking at, we're trying to think about hypothesis statements. So if you're familiar with Barry O'Reilly, he talks about hypothesis driven development. It's the same for culture. I think I'm in a place at the moment where what we're trying to do is, is take some of the positive things that we do in software teams and take them to the enterprise. What we're struggling with slightly is that a lot of the examples we have are specific to digital. They're specific to software. They're specific to an e-commerce customer journey, customer funnel. And it's trying to make sure that we make that language generic enough and the intent understood so that we can apply some of these things to our risk team, to our compliance team, to lawyers, to HR, everybody. We want to be inclusive um, with these changes. Again, we talk about inclusivity, diversity. Um, these things need to make sense to everybody. So again, we're talking about the fact that it's an experiment. Um, we have a, a reason why we want to do something. We have an understanding of the impact we would like to see on people. Um, so we start talking about the outcome that we want to see and some of the leading and lagging indicators that we want to see. So again, we're starting to get people to think about in the next few days, the next few weeks, what are some of the changes that we could make? Why would we make them? And what will give us some confidence that it's having the right impact? Um, we've talked about the fact that we don't want people to have to feel like they need to escalate to our board of management, our, our, um, our C-suite of directors. Now, if we set a measure that says uh, nobody is, is allowed to escalate anymore, then that's probably going to be a disaster. So really it's digging into what are the reasons why people escalate and can we fix some of those things? So 
again, it's getting the measures right, because again, the measures themselves, I've, I've talked about this a lot in the past, measures directly impact behavior as well. So thinking about a hypothesis statement is thinking about why are we doing it? What impact would we like to see? What outcome? And then how are we gonna measure to know whether this is having the right impact on our people? Um, so let's talk, just mention our CIO, uh, Christian Metzner. So he's, um, he's a massive sponsor for, for cultural change. Um, the blessing and the curse with Christian is that he's an IT guy. Um, and because of that, he's driving, he's almost like our chief transformation officer, if there is such a title. But because he's coming from the IT department, this, the assumption is that this is just software. Um, and so he, the biggest thing he's trying to, to, to get past is that whilst he's in charge of IT, he's trying to encourage change across the whole organization. It's, it's the culture of the whole organization and actually the, the broader Volkswagen group as well. So we're trying to work more closely with our, with our brands, with our group. Um, we have lots of partners as well. So again, it's one step at a time, but what he's tried to do is to try and role model some of the specific things that he can do. And again, some of these things in isolation may seem really petty, but it's trying to understand the intent behind them and trying to understand whether they're having a, a good impact or not. So, you know, he's done something that a lot of our directors have never done before. He's got an open door policy. Now, it seems, seems really odd, but again, it's quite, it's quite a, for, for the building that we're in and, and some of the work that we're doing, it seems like quite a modern organization, but actually a lot of the directors, you, you'll either never see them, uh, or if they're in the building, they'll either be in meetings or they'll be in their room with the door shut. So Christian's tried to make sure that every week, he has an hour where his door is open and anybody can walk in and ask him anything. And you know that in the early days that worked really well. Um, he gets some, on some occasions, he now gets less people doing that. And obviously the doors are open. It's the zoom call is open, but um, the intent is there that he wants to be more accessible to people, more, more approachable. We got something called a fudge up night. The, the language is soft and slightly. It was called something else, but essentially again, trying to encourage people to talk about the things that have not gone well, where they feel like they have failed, and they can share what they learn. So again, he was trying to encourage this whole, let's not hide behind a service level agreement or, or a percentage or an incident number. Actually, let's talk about situations that have happened, the impact it's had on us, our teams, our customers, and let's, let's talk more about what we've learned from that situation and how we can learn from each other. We've had walking meetings. Again, lots of people don't leave their desk all day. They feel like they have to work through lunch. Um, if they do have lunch, they don't leave the building. So again, particularly now more than ever um a lot of the meetings i'm having i'm trying to do at least some of them while i'm out for a walk um so again he's trying to role model that behavior um he's we've started doing blogs so again the way that we socialize and share information we've got a department blog called bits and bytes where we invite guest speakers to and at the moment it's been really good they're sharing their kind of day-to-day -day routine how they're finding lockdown um he does coffees with he's done a coffee with every team member since he's joined um, he's got a policy where he will only read his emails before half nine and after four. Uh, he'll probably admit himself he doesn't work nine to five, he works longer than that. That's something else he needs to start to role model is that we're working smarter, not harder and longer. Um, I'll show you a video in a minute. He did the day, he's doing the day in the life of the CIO. So he's let other people, um, it's a bit, it's a bit of a joke, but it's, it's good for morale. He's let other people um, shadow him for the day. Um, some more junior members of the team. So some more junior members of the team have been in some of our board meetings. Um, he's very, very keen on collaborating with other organizations, but in a very transparent way. So Arm in Cambridge, um, we've done lots of work with John Smart from Deloitte and, and Barry O'Reilly. Um, and another thing, again, it seems quite obvious, but a lot of the decisions that were being made were being made by more senior people than you, because it was just easier to say to somebody, I'm going to ask you to make that decision for me because you're more senior than me. And it was, it was down to grade and down to hippo. Um, he's tried to manage more by numbers. So I don't care what level you're at, make a decision based on data. And if you don't have data, go and get it. Um, so just a few examples, and I'll come on to some more specifics, but I think it's important in any organization that you have got somebody relatively senior who is sponsoring this type of thing. It's not just about some of those statements around accountability and autonomy. What are you doing as a leader? And what do you see your leaders doing? Because that's, that's who you're learning from. You know, they should be role modeling. I'm not just telling you to be accountable, I'm accountable. I'm not just saying make a decision based on data. I make my decisions based on data. Um, so again, it's important for us and for our teams and for our leaders. If we're saying these things, we have to do them. We have to lead by example. Anyone can be a leader. So let's come up with some of these things. Let's try them. And as I say, some of these culture hacks, we're going to take them to the fudge up night um, because it's going to be a disaster. We're going to alienate people. We're going to anger people. People are going to be throwing virtual chairs. 
um, some of these things are going to make sense and some of them aren't. So again, so it's all about experimenting and, and learning. Um, so I'm just going to play a quick video. If people can't hear this, then put their hands up. This blew um, Stuart's ears off a minute ago, so you might need to turn the speakers down. Oh, I've just flipped past it. There you go. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, you can't park here. Oh, uh, no, I'm, I'm CIO for the day. I'm, I'm bored of management. There's a visitor park, huh? I didn't know. Okay, sorry, I'll, uh, I'll move around now for you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Hi, my name's David Buchanan, I'm 24 and I currently work in the small change uh, local business applications team, uh, so I'm a developer for them. Uh, and today I'm luckily going to be the CIO for the day. Hi, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's just not working out the same way as what I thought it would do, so um, sorry to say, but you're fired. David, are you out of your mind? It doesn't work like this. No, uh, CIO for the day? Come, no. Uh, yes, you're the CEO, but there are rules, and especially you in that role, you have to act as a role model, and you have to follow the rules. Uh, uh, Fix uh, it. I'll, I'll sort it out for you. I'll sort it out. Okay. Ingrid? Hello! How are you? You okay? Forget that last conversation that we had. No, I, I don't have the authority to do that. Um, I didn't mean it, of course. Um, so uh, you just enjoy your day, uh, and uh, I'll see you soon, okay? Thank you. Bye bye. Good afternoon, Dan. How are you doing? You alright? Yeah, good. How are you? I'm ready. Um, I'm good. I'm happy. Uh, we got a one-to-one -to -one today. How's your day going? Uh, my, day, my day's going excellent, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been in quite a few meetings today. Had uh, just a big one there with uh, Gene and uh, Mike. Hi. Good morning. Christian. Hi. Hi, Mike. How are you? So, I'd like to introduce uh, your new CIO. Thank you. Steering the future we are today. Steering the future. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all, all good. All I good. like that tagline. Steering no, the future steer, today. Steering the future today. Yeah, I Not like tomorrow. It. Some point then. Yeah. Now, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Christian. Have you enjoyed your day off today? How do you think it's gone? I definitely enjoyed my day, so I, I had a very good time together with uh, David. I'm very happy that he uh, runs through the day with me together and um, yeah, also I, I really enjoyed talking to him to hear his view on yeah, lots of different questions and, and topics, so I really enjoyed it. How do you think today went David and would you like to be the CIO again? I have had a wonderful day being the CIO, um, getting to see Christian, going into so many different types of meetings and the knowledge that he has to require to be able to answer all of the questions that people are asking him, it, it, to me it is mind boggling. I, I already thought that he did a lot of work but it, it's blown it out of the water what I've actually saw today. Um, it was great being in a meeting with uh, Gene and Mike and just being able to sit there in the board of management room, which I'd never been in before, and I just sat back and I was like, wow, this is, this is crazy. Um, would I do it again? A hundred percent, but give me a couple of weeks because I need to sleep because it, I'm, I'm tired now. It's been the end of the day and it's crazy. But uh, yeah, no, thank you, uh, Christine, for letting me do this. Um, and may other people uh, volunteer because it really is a good thing. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm just leaving, but I, I forgot to ask, am I getting paid a CIO wage for today? Um, I mean, I didn't get a Christian's car or, I don't know, an extra holiday? I don't know, something like that. Um, I'm tired, very, very tired now. Um, I've had more meetings today than I've ever had before. So I think I might uh, just go home and get a Chinese and then go to bed. Um, all right, sweet, see you later. Just, you know, now that I've got the opportunities, um, when when you first came, uh, we invited you to football, didn't we, on uh, Tuesday nights. Very kind. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you were very good. Well done. Um, <laughs> however, You're not saying that because the camera's on, No, right? no. Okay, good. I'm, good a, to I'm about to tell you that you, you called me Jamie um, throughout, I would say, three months of football, uh, always, Jamie do this, Jamie do that, or get on the ball. Um, now, it got to the point where I I couldn't tell you anymore that my name wasn't <laughs> Jamie because I didn't know how to approach that conversation. Yeah. Um, 
It, it, but then, can you remember how you unveiled that you knew my name? Can you remember that? I, I can remember quite clearly. <laughs> you were in the Christmas party. Uh, I believe you'd just come over from having some Jägermeister, maybe. And you go, I know you're David. And then I was like, oh my god, he knows my name. And then, and then we both walked away, and then from there onwards, we've, you've, you've called me David. Yeah. A couple of times called me Jamie yeah. in football. But do, you know, do you know why I called you Jamie? Uh, uh, no. I mean, in the beginning, and bear with me, uh, is, uh, if you have several hundred names to learn, it's quite uh, challenging. But of course. That should not be disrespectful. I thought you were the people called you Jamie on the pitch because a lot of people always called you Jamie Carragher is coming, which oh. we, of course, obviously like. And I said, okay, it must be his nickname. Okay. And I, said, I said, okay, let's crack on with Jamie. Uh, for reference <laughs> for everyone else, uh, there's another Jamie on the pitch. Uh, I know, uh, I, know yeah. I know. I mean, I like being compared to Jamie Carragher. I'll take that, I'll take that. Yeah, Shall the future is bright, yeah. Cool, can everyone hear me again? Good. Technology is working, good. Um, I think Jägermaster is probably a culture hack as well. Um, so yeah, that was just, it's, that's banter really, but that was just, again, one of the things, we do a, a, an, all, an all staff update and um, we, do, we do an IT department sort of all hands fairly regularly and they're just the sort of things, they're just a, just a little bit of fun. But again, it just shows the kind of openness and transparency that Christian's looking for. He's taken the time out to do that sort of thing, um, which again, we can all do in our teams. And often if some of these things happen, it's just, it's just about socializing them. You know, we would chuck that video on YouTube. It's probably only had a few views, but it makes a lot of us smile when we when we watch it. So, um, yeah, what I was going to go through now is just just go through a few specific uh, culture hacks I've sort of tried in the past, um, clarify the sort of goal. Uh, what we're going to do then in a few minutes, I'm going to break you out to a couple of groups and just talk through some of them. Uh, just think a little bit about some that you might like to try potentially uh, in your teams, and then we'll and then we'll come back together. So, uh, another one is uh, culture hacks called a, a personal retrospective. So, this is and again, we're, we're a very typical organization. Our line management processes you know, dictate that we have a certain number of objectives and um, we have an end of year appraisal and, and calibration processes and all the other stuff you'd expect. Um, but it's about how we try and encourage our line managers to spend more time talking about the person and, and how the person's feeling and that person's career path um, and a little bit less around some of the more formal, um, how much uh, you know, percentage of your time you're spending against a certain objective. Because again, we're trying to be more outcome based. Um, so rather than setting objectives at the start of the year that turn out to be not valuable by the end, um, we're talking more about an outcome and a, a hypothesis and, and about how you're feeling and, and your confidence and your happiness. Um, so again, the goal behind that really is personal reflection, um, constantly looking at your results and your relationships with others and the actions that you're taking. Um, a a pre-mortem, some of you may have heard of pre-mortems, um, I think we call them kamikaze, um, but essentially with a group that's about to embark on achieving a, an outcome to think about all the things that could happen if that outcome was a complete disaster. So we've tried to deliver something to the market. If we, even if we have delivered it, you know, it hasn't realized the value we thought, customers are angry, the phones are going, uh, and then work backwards to think about what, what caused that to happen. Um, and really it's a bit of a trendy way of, of um, writing down all your risks and assumptions on the wall. Um, but again, every assumption is a hypothesis waiting to happen. So uh, any assumption that you make uh, could be correct or incorrect. So it's an experiment. So again, why are you making that assumption uh, and what can you do to test it as quickly as possible? Uh, celebrating headphones. So again, I'm not sure people have worked in teams where um, developers in particular will put the headphones on and that means leave me alone, I'm busy. Um, you know, the intent around the headphones is respecting people's personal space, really digging into how people like to communicate, when is best to communicate, so sort of this, the empathy side uh, of things. Um, and thinking about productivity. There's obviously a different side to that. If people have got their headphones on all of the time they're in the office, they're, they're not approachable or they're not wanting to collaborate with the team, but it will highlight a problem that needs to be discussed. So again, another interesting way, if you're not doing that already, um, to think a little bit around team and distraction and productivity and all those sorts of things. Uh, book club. So uh, again, done this a few times in the past. Um, if there is a topic like culture hacks, um, that a few people in your team are, are interested in, you know, go out to the internet, seek um, you know, white papers, case studies, YouTube videos, books, and learn together. Um, I think really importantly, you know, I've had a few times in, in VWFS where uh, Christian, the CIO, and a few others have said, I've read this book, uh, I recommend you read it. But that's a huge investment for me. I don't really like reading very much. And so for me to go to the effort of reading a book takes me weeks and weeks and weeks. And if I don't know why I'm reading it, 
then I haven't really got the motivation. If you know you're going through a book chapter by chapter and you're talking about how some of the things you're learning can be applied to your teams. So whether that's about, as I say, culture hacks, Kanban, whatever the topic may be, there's a little bit more motivation, hopefully, because you're both reading. You're trying to make sure that one person's not going off and reading the whole book on their own um, and that you're doing it chapter by chapter and you're discussing what you're learning and what you're applying. Because uh, otherwise sharing a book reference is okay, but if people don't know why they're uh, digesting that information, then it can help with motivation. Uh, and again, another bit of a petty one, but I've worked in organizations where um, calendars are completely open. You can see every meeting that everybody's in, every meeting's got an agenda. Uh, we try and keep meetings as short as possible. I've worked in other places. We're a little bit guilty of this, um, particularly those that are more senior to me. They're in back-to-back -back meetings for at least the next two weeks. It just says busy. I don't know where they are or what they're doing. Um, again, it's a good one to discuss. You know, is there transparency? Is there not? Do I need to know where my manager is and what he's doing? Probably not. But what does it say if everybody's just busy all the time and, and I don't know if I can get hold of them or not? So again, it's another one to talk about trust and how we like to be contacted and, and when we like to be contacted. Uh, a lot of the things I'm talking about of the book, uh, Bruce Daisley, uh, The Joy of Work. Um, in there, he talks about uh, a lot of these kind of these hacks that we can do um, around culture. Um, he calls it uh, fixing your work culture. Um, but again, a lot of this is around how we work together, how we collaborate, talking about how we're feeling. Um, so what I'm going to try and do now is just break us off into groups for 10 minutes. Uh, I'll share in the group that you're in the link to, um, to a list of culture hacks. So I've, I've picked out a few just then, but there is a, there's a bigger list. Um, so I'm just interested for 10 minutes in your groups. Just talk through uh, some in that list, some that I talked about. Are there any that you'd be particularly interested in trying? Um, and then we'll come back together. And if anybody wants to share uh, any, any thoughts that it's triggered, anything you'd like to try, then I'd be, I'd be grateful. I'm going to attempt to um, break you into groups now. Uh, stop sharing. Okay, breakout rooms. And we've got. Okay, so there'll be, about, there'll be three or four of you in a group. Um, we get two for the price of one. Um, so, okay, I'm going to create rooms now um, and I'll, I'll chuck you out in 10 minutes. Cool. All right, I'll speak to you all in a minute. We'll hopefully be getting an invite. Good luck.
Hey, I think we've got everyone back again. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you. Hey, David. Cool. This is this is always the moment when you look at the thing and you think, has anybody caught in the ether between <laughs> breakout rooms? And they're just floating around, never to return. <laughs> well, we, we tried um, we tried the equivalent in Microsoft Teams, and it's a bad equivalent. Um, we got people tra again. trapped in calls. It was uh, a bit of a mess, but we got there in the end. Well, they are, you're, you're, yeah, you're paused, and you don't know where you're paused. You're somewhere, but you don't know where. Um, that 10 minutes went really quickly, so hopefully... I hope there was a few few interesting things discussed. Um, does any, any of the groups want to share uh, any of the hacks they're interested in or, or wanted to try or have tried in the past? I'll go, go, on. Like, go on. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Um, so something that stood out to me and those who have done the, the ICP ACC with like John Barrett and that will, will know about this. So the no rank thing. So removing all the rank and ins insignia and place calls from meetings. Um, so we did something similar when you when we did this coaching course where there's this idea of um, I think John calls it muhinshu. It comes from like um, like Japan where it basically there is no rank and there's no privilege. So that was something that we would start every single day with where he would just that there was a, I can't remember what the logo was now, but um, I think I could fish it out. But it's pretty cool. It's just like a little logo, and it's like that means that there's no rank and there's no privilege. So. It's just a nice way to, to basically start off a session. Yeah. Cool. That's good. Thanks, Kerry. One of the things that I suggested, actually something that I've used before, is um, you're on Zoom calls, but you're on Zoom calls, particularly in these, this day and age at the moment, just to do work-related stuff. Yeah. Nobody says you can't have a Zoom coffee break and just chat to your colleagues about anything other than work. You know, and we've done that a few times where, you know, like before when you're in the office, you grab a coffee, you grab it with a colleague, you maybe sit in the canteen or in the coffee, just have a quick gossip, quick chat, just to kind of break down the day a little bit. Um, so nobody says you can't actually do that. Go make yourself a coffee, sit down, get a Zoom call up, but only talk about anything other than work. Just, yep. so you're just spending time together effectively, building a bit of a team rapport with each other. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff. We, we, we were talking about, well, on, on here about the, the mobile phones piece, but actually then sort of saying how, how now in the world we are right now in terms of people having their cameras on versus them having them off and, you know, trying to understand what's going on at the other end of that camera that, you know, somebody may have a child running around mad, they got the camera off, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's also how, how can we, how can we, um, you know, maintain the level of you know activeness in, in the engagement you know, so how can people be actively engaged and how can we kind of um ensure that you know as a, as a team we're all signed up to that and you know we're respectful and and, and yeah. such like um yeah so i think you know obviously the, the the whole concept of banning a device from a meeting or anything you can't really do that when you're in a remote world right else there'll be nobody in the meeting so you'll be a bit, <laughs> it'll be a little bit of a quiet one um so yeah so trying to think about how we can how we can do that more as well yeah yeah having it off at work's not ideal anyway for engagement um but i think the the, the whole camera side um is another interesting one again what what what's driving is similar to the headphones being on and like you said, devices in meetings. Um, why why are people doing that? What's driving that behaviour? Um, uh, again, what outcome are we looking for? Uh, you know, increased engagement and all those sorts of things. So, again, it's trying to be quite objective, measurable in some of the changes that we're making, um, rather than either keeping the things to ourselves or just suggesting that we make changes. Because I think even with even with the best of um, or sorry, the best, the most engaged teams, um, there's only so many changes you can suggest until people start to lose motivation for it unless there's a real reason why we're doing stuff and a way of measuring that actually it's it's making a, a decent impact on the team and on on the customer any other thoughts yes so uh, just just to build on that david as well about the whole devices thing and and the engagement we often talk about building rapport and trust and you know that's a really good way of doing it um you know you could start with the yeah we want to we want to feel that you're engaged etc but as you mature and, and and build that relationship sometimes it's not a problem if you need to switch your camera off because we trust you're in the room you're still with us yep. so but it, it i guess there's a bit of a maturity curve there to, to to go on in terms of that so 
it could be banning devices or, or saying, can we refrain from doing this, could be construed as you not being trusted or them, you know, feeling like they're not trusted. So I think we have to really play that one quite carefully. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's with cameras as well, though. Cameras, you get, you, you're trying to read body language as well, which you can when you're in person. You can't do that um, generally. You know what I mean? So on, on Zoom calls and stuff like that. So if you don't have your cameras on, it is a little bit harder to kind of get people's, you know, what some of these expressions are or how they're feeling about something. You know, yeah. Sometimes people don't say stuff, but you can see it in their face. Uh, yeah. And then you may want to say, you, you look a bit concerned, you know, what, what is it that you, you're worried about? And you can kind of make the conversation get a bit more engaged. So there are benefits and, and the positives and negatives to both, but just try to work out what works well. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes when you say to people, oh, you're, you're, you, you don't look like you're comfortable, that makes them even more uncomfortable mm. because you've literally <laughs> drawn attention to the fact that they're not comfortable. So it's, it's really, it's a really tough one to, to, to measure. The best thing that I've found to do on Zoom is, I don't know if anyone else does this, but I was talking to some of the other DMs about this, turning off self-view, because I don't know if you guys do this, but I found myself doing this, is you would be talking to everyone, but you're looking at yourself, yeah. which is stupid yeah. because you're not talking to yourself, you're talking to everyone else, right? So yeah. turn off self-view, best thing ever. Honestly, it doesn't matter. I, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. God knows. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. It's all right. We'll pick it up on a recording, Kieran. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you can't see that thing behind you right now. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why is that thing behind me? Cool. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly, quickly share my screen again. But as I say, um, the, the, the power of this sort of thing is in the conversation. Um, I think what I'm realizing more and more is, is there's a good intent behind the culture changes we're trying to make, but it is very abstract. Um, and there's also a lot of really good work going on in some of our product teams trying this stuff day to day. And it's just trying to join those things together. What is it that we're trying in a team? And then really get, get objective with it. Because again, a lot of these things seem petty. So you probably don't, you don't glorify them. You, you don't think about, you know, we, we all just, we all talked about something in a retrospective. Uh, we set an action, we tried it um, and it did or didn't work. But, you know, the power for this comes from being objective about why you did it, how you're measuring success. And again, that can be people's happiness, sentiment, that sort of thing. And then sharing it, good or bad. Um, some of our teams have tried things, hasn't worked out. The person that was, um, we may have given responsibility to somebody, they didn't like it, we talked about it. But again, it still shows that teams are trying new ways of doing things. And that, that really is the important thing now. We can't write our culture down or, or in a book or, or on the wall. Um, this is all about how we're working together and, and the things that we're trying. As I say, everything's an experiment. So you know, we encourage our teams to try new technology uh, new frameworks and to share it. It's exactly the same ways of working. We need to get within within limits. We need to get experimental with this stuff. We don't want to cause chaos um, or unforeseen impacts on other people, but we need to experiment with how we do things and, and how we behave and how we how we interact with each other. Uh, and I think for me, the importance is trying to think about um, why we would make a change, how we would measure it to know it's successful and, and sharing it, good or bad, share it with other people, get talking about it. And it may seem really petty, um, but we're trying to make sure that a lot of this stuff is, is sustainable. It's the legacy we're trying to drive. The business models that we have, the products that we make, they can change. Um, but the way people treat each other, the way we behave, um, that will be the case for a long time. So those are the things that we really need to focus on. Um, I think I've been in some businesses where some of the directors were quite clear. A bit like as we've seen during COVID, we can, we can pivot on our business model but the way our people treat each other, the way they behave, the way they talk to customers, that's a really important thing. What we sell and how we sell it, we can change and, and technology will change that, but the culture is really, really important. So now is the time, focus on that stuff, however petty it seems, try something. And as I say, even if it's you, you know, leading by example and changing the way you collaborate with someone, the way that you treat someone, doing something in a certain situation, you're leading by example. And if that means that one other person notices and does that as well, one other person does that, um, you know, we talked about, it's not great, but we talked about how quickly based on a reproduction rate, viruses can spread. It's going to be the same with some of this cultural stuff. If you can influence the people around you, that sounds like a, this book's right in itself. Um, but yeah, the kind of the reproduction rate of uh, culture, there you go. If that's above one, then, uh, then we're going to spread pretty quick. So yeah, as I say, try stuff, share it, um, get collaborating with the different parts of the business. That's my, that's my advice. 
I think that is me. Any any other thoughts? David, in terms of the 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 sort of stuff you've done with other organisations, so you, you said about the transparency and that. What, what are the sort of things you, you've you've been doing with them? Just out of curiosity. Um, I think it's what you share and how often you share it. I think at Volkswagen we're um, in recent months we have been absolutely brilliant at um, getting people on a video call, being extremely transparent about how the business is doing financially, some of the decisions that we're, we're making. We've been, it's made people a little bit nervous, but we started talking about our redundancy policy, but again, we're doing it early. Um, we've started talking about the fact that a number of people in the organization are gonna to have to change their skill set. So we're making it very clear from a values and culture perspective, what we're looking for, but skill sets, we're not completely sure. So we're trying to be as transparent and as early with some of these things as we possibly can. Not everything can be shared all the time. Um, as I say, I think a lot of the intent is there. If you can share the intent, it's trying to, we've got a pretty woolly uh, vision and a pretty abstract mission, but some of the strategic intent, some of the objectives that are starting to come out, some of the markets we want to play in, some of the measures of success we have for the business are now starting to come through. Um, and we're just being very transparent about it all. It's not perfect. Um, teams are going to have to collaborate on um, and it's going to seem like the board's being really lazy, but I think it's important. We're going to have to have focus groups that are going to look, uh, talk about some of our strategic objectives. So, you know, certain markets we want to have uh, growth in. Actually, what should we be doing? What should we be measuring? And we're going to hopefully start to include uh, cross-functional groups in those decisions. So not just a cross-functional team to deliver what we've already decided, cross-functional groups in helping us decide what the actual objective is in the first place and how we will measure success in that area. So. It's trying to be more collaborative, I think, and transparent. And where you don't know, say you don't know. Um, but yeah, as I said, I think but the intent has been shared. We're having lots of, um, and again, I'm sure a lot of companies are doing this, but it's important. We're talking a lot about things that are topical. You know, we've had, as I'm sure a lot of companies had, the, the uh, Black Lives Matter. We've, because again, we talk a lot around inclusion and diversity, but again, what does that mean? So we're encouraging people to talk about what it means to them, how we're currently doing, good or bad. You know, we've got some, some really positive things in our business and some pretty awful things that have happened in the last few months about how people have treated each other, the language that's been used. Um, so it's important to have those conversations. Um, I think what we're realizing is um, it's it, when we talk about trust and respect, um, I realized kind of that today, you, what you want is someone to feel brave enough to say to somebody in the moment, I'm not comfortable with that, or I'm not sure that's the right thing. And that's probably the place we're, we're trying to get to, but yeah, I think it, this is all around um, taking all the language that we use for products and turning it into culture. So we talk about early and continuous delivery of value. Um, it's trying to, that early and continuous, it's, it needs to be about the changes that we're making to our, to our culture. And again, it's trying to turn a lot of those abstract words into actual action right now. Because again, I can, I, can, I can put a beautiful presentation together that says all our teams are going to be autonomous and accountable. And no one has a, an, no one has a clue what our strategy is then I have no clue how to prioritize changes. Um, and we still end up with people feeling you know, disengaged and demotivated. So we can tell them you're accountable to make a decision, but if they don't feel like they can, if they can't make decisions based on data because they don't have access to the data, it's all the really stupid stuff, but that's what we're trying to dig, dig into at the moment, actually properly collab collaborate with a cross-functional group on the strategy, um, as opposed to just getting them set up in cross-functional teams to deliver the changes that we've already set. It's a very long answer, mm -hmm. isn't it? But yeah. This stuff's really hard. Um, and what you do in one that, company won't work in another. It, it, when you say um, cross-functional team to look at that, that whole piece, is that at a particular level or is that actually doesn't matter of level? Um, You're trying to get people from down in the teams and stuff because yeah, yeah. one, of the, things, one yeah, yeah. of the things we're finding, for example, going through what we're going through with Dunno at the moment, a lot of the, that's coming from up here now. Yeah. And it's just being fed down and that's, not where we really, well, in my mind, where we're not where we want to be, and it's how we kind of get that balance back. So we've got three different working groups going on, and one is a mix of C-suite and directors, one's a mix of directors and heads of, and then one's a mix of heads of and teams. So hopefully we're going to get some cross-pollination. It's not perfect, but, um, and again, this is hard work. We've got one group set up where we're doing some, um, some work with Barry O'Reilly, and so he will spend an hour with us on a Thursday afternoon, and we, we feel really proud of ourselves because we managed to convince a lot of the directors that they, should, they can give us somebody from risk, somebody from HR, somebody from sales. And we're all on a call with Barry O'Reilly. We're all learning about hypothesis-driven development and uh, how to have a roadmap in an agile team. 
uh, how to design your teams, you know, experiments, hypotheses, leading lagging indicators, all the stuff we're probably comfortable with. Um, and we're starting to lose people from the group. And it's, it's how do we feel about that? So we've invited somebody in to talk about something and we continue to talk about software. We continue to talk about things that are related to software. The language that we use hasn't changed. And so this is something we're going to have to learn is we're going to lose some people from that group, even though we've invited them in. I feel like it's job done. How amazing am I? Create a cross-functional group and we've invited people in to learn about all the things that we're saying are amazing in IT and we, they're disengaged because the language isn't right. So we're going to learn a lot. I, maybe if it's okay, I'll probably do a talk later in the summer um, to share some of the things because already we're struggling with this. We've lost people from the group. Um, but again, I think if we, you have to learn that the change adoption is hard. Some of those people will be disengaged. They'll go back to their, you know, we've lost someone from our, um, our collections teams and some of our operations teams because they're busy. You know, we're saying to them, can you please join us for four hours a week, including the, the homework that we get set. Uh, we start talking about hypothesis driven development and we've lost them. Uh, they're busy. They're probably having to work a little bit of overtime to catch up. Uh, and again, we probably need to understand that as long as they can understand the intent behind some of those things, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and get them in six months time. We're probably not ready for the enterprise thing. Um, but the intent of is, is right. The fact that we, if we want to be, um, we were talking around having pace and flexibility in our business. Um, we're only going to get that by having a cross-functional group that can deliver change end to end. So again, there's no point in building software. If we don't price it in the right way, we don't try and sell it in the right way. We don't market it in the right way. If we, have missed a trick from a security perspective. Uh, and I think this is probably the place a lot of companies are in at the moment is um, we've got some good stuff going on in software. Everyone's very proud of the fact they can release code every 12 seconds. But a lot of the decisions we make around investment, a lot of decisions we make around marketing could be improved. So this is an end to end um, value stream as we're talking about. But yeah, it's just really, really difficult stuff and trying to be collaborative as possible. And as I say, some people won't be ready for it. You'll, you'll lose them from that conversation. Um, it's how how you go and get them back again. All right. Any other, any other final questions? Anybody I've got one. If we've got time. Yeah, of course. Keep it on the Leicester score. It's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying it's still one nil, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you said um, that you do things like reviews, annual objectives and calibration. Um, and, and you said, as you'd expect, <laughs> as, I've, as i've come to expect but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so how do you tackle big ticket items like that 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 really do impact culture um i think we're still we're still grappling with that again i'd like to come back at, uh two three months time and talk about it again i think first step is to talk to people in in hr and figure out their sentiment and actually a lot of the people i'm talking to um they they get that it's it's not the right process for us uh, if you look at our principles and the culture that we want. But in our business in particular, and again, this is quite common, uh, we have a headquarters. Uh, our headquarters is based in Germany and a lot of these um, policies and procedures are not easy to change. And so I know this is really easy to say, and this is a really lazy answer, but you pilot it. And so this is, not, this is what we're now talking about. Can we pilot? And we're still at the can we pilot stage, but we've got a couple of people, quite senior people in HR uh, in our group. And it, this is now looking at how, in the very short term, how can we do some of the things we're talking about in and still do or still satisfy the requirements of the headquarters. So there will still be a calibration process. There will still be an annual appraisal. Um, but the conversations that we're having with our managers, I think first and foremost, a lot of our line managers don't enjoy what they do. It's, it's admin intensive. Um, they're only having that conversation twice a year. Um, so how can we make sure that our line managers are understand their role? I think it's probably an important one. Cause again, we're talking more about product teams. It's not my job to tell you what you need to do this week anymore. Cause I was comfortable talking about a to do list. I knew you, I knew what you were doing and now you're in a team and I don't know you and I don't know what you're doing. And I'm being asked to ask you if you're happy. That's not comfortable for me. So I love what we're doing at the moment in particularly in IT is talking to the managers about whether they're comfortable being a people manager. Um, or whether they'd like to be more of a senior technical specialist type person. So what do they enjoy? Do they enjoy getting the best out of people? Or are they in that role because it was the only way they could take a more senior position, which we've got a lot of. Um, our line managers are senior people, are senior technical specialists that wanted, wanted a better income, wanted progression. 
So that's, yeah, we've got lots of things to fix, but I think first and foremost, it's the managers themselves, how do they feel? And then if we can have a bit of a, bit of a restructure in our area, sort out the roles and responsibilities, uh, it's the conversations that we then start to have, knowing that there's still gonna be a calibration process. We would like to decouple uh, pay rises and bonuses from that process. Um, that's not gonna happen in the short term. Um, so can we remove the surprise that we sometimes get where the grade that we, you think you're going to get is not the grade you get because you go through a calibration process. So can, can um, some of the managers calibrate outside of the main process to make sure that we're happy with standards of how we're grading people. So yeah, it's more frequent collaboration in that area rather than waiting for things to change. This stuff's really difficult. <clears throat> So. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's, it's things like, um, as you say, changing structure, yeah. you know, how can you do that with a, a hypothesis? Cause it's, it's uncomfortable to take people out of a structure yeah, they're yeah. really familiar with as a yeah. hypothesis. We don't know if this is going to work. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a good point. So our HR department gets it, but they're very cautious. So what we're also now trying to do is, um, companies like Cardo, Skybet, some of those companies that have gone out to conferences to talk about, um, agile HR to try and get um, advocates in their business to talk to advocates in our business that are in HR roles. It's proven a bit of a struggle. <clears throat> we're in a crisis situation. It's not ideal, but we were almost at the point where there was a lady in a quite senior position at Skybet who's going to link up with a lady in a quite senior position in our HR department because they need, they need a little bit of certainty that this, this can work because you're exactly right. If we're talking about changing structure, making an investment of people's time, uh, training something, um, if it's based on a hypothesis of this might be better, it might not. Um, and then if we do it and, and it doesn't actually make people more productive, happier, all those other things, then our headquarters are going to, uh, have a bit of, I told you so moment, which is, again, we, we need stuff like that because we're not always going to get it right. We are experimenting, but we need to play in areas where we think that we've got a good chance of being successful, which is cheating slightly, but yeah. Thank you. Thanks Tim. All right. Um, yeah, I'll share the slides and I'll share a link to those hacks. Um, so Bruce's book is worth a read. Uh, if you look up Gartner Culture Hacks um, last year and this year, they've done quite a lot of um, papers on it. Uh, just, just go and try some stuff. Um, yeah, please, if anyone wants to pick up with me, stuff they're trying, good or bad. Um, again, I'm keen to share different teams, different businesses, stuff, that, stuff that's having a good effect. Um, Pomodoro, all these other techniques that they, people try with teams. It's all, it's all with good intent. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. Really appreciate it, mate. As always. Anybody got any last questions for David? No. Cool. Okay. Well, I'll probably tap you up actually, David, to come and have a chat with some of our guys to talk about some culture hacks. That would okay. be a good idea. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, guys. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank Thanks you for Thanks joining. Thanks so much. Cheers, Cheers guys. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.